there's nothing like being double mic'd up to talk to a group. I feel like I have a holster and I could just at any moment pull my guns from both sides. How's the volume? Because I have a loud voice and so I'm a little scared about, you know, two mics and talking to you all. Am I, is it okay? We good? How are you all? That's not the truth. Come on. It's like the last month of school. Isn't it just hard work at the end? You just almost have to prop each other up, right? And so just encourage each other and prop each other up. And t every day start with a little caffeine and get that buzz going. And you will get through May just like that. It'll be in your rearview mirror. And then you'll be missing the kids before you know it. And you'll be ready to get right back in it again. I am happy to be here today because I love teacher evaluation. And that sounds like a crazy thing to say. But I really do. I have great joy. Some of, my, some of my best experiences as an administrator revolved around teacher evaluation and what that model looked like. Now, I have been in the school system for a long time. I'm a graduate of Maryville College, and I got hired by Maryville City Schools as soon as I graduated from Maryville College. So that was kind of nice. I never left town. I taught first grade and fifth grade at Sam Houston Elementary. When Foothills was built, I went across town and I taught fourth grade at Foothills Elementary. I've raised three kids in the process and during all those times of raising kids, I did a job share program. So I worked a half day every day and I was a language arts consultant and I went around the state and I just did training for language arts and that worked really great as I was doing the family thing. And then all the kids got into school and started getting on into the, into the grade levels and then I decided that I would go back full time Went back full time as a fourth grade teacher. Then I did a technology coordinator position. And then I went for a little while and I worked in gifted ed. And then I worked a little bit in special ed. And then I became an assistant principal. And then I became the principal at Foothills. And then I moved to the central office like this is my third year at central office. Now, here's the thing. I think I have the most job titles of everybody in Maryville. So I'm happy to announce that that is my claim to fame. But I love variety and I'll be honest with you. I've loved all of those experiences, but the greatest experience of all is teaching school. Uh, that's the best job I've ever had. It's the greatest job. I, <laughs> did you fix it? <laughs> You're not my Van of White. No. Oh, it's all gone. How I was wishing for that. So that has always been my favorite job, and I would be very content going back into the classroom and teaching as I just kind of glide into retirement in 10 to 15 years from now. See, I've got a lot of energy left. I'm not having any plans even after 30 plus years. I'm here today to talk with you about Tiger. One of my favorite books is a book written by Charlotte Danielson, and her book is called Talk About Teaching. And the whole book focuses on how can we improve instruction, therefore student achievement and student growth through the teacher evaluation model. Well, that's really the whole purpose, right? That's why we do it. That is why it is there. Now, when the state of Tennessee decided, let's evaluate every teacher every year, that kind of moved a lot of cheese around, and administrators were flapping, and not to mention the teachers were spiraling and spinning. And I sure get that, because that is a, that is a big job to do. It's a change from what we're used to, and it kind of put everybody on edge a little bit. And what makes it a little difficult is to follow Charlotte Danielson's advice and use it more organically, where you talk about the rubric all the time and you're always in the classroom looking for things, evidence that fulfills the rubric. And you have these little sidebar conversations as you're leaving that classroom saying, you were spot on with questioning. Or you go over here and you say, your environment was really unbelievable. The way you greeted your kids at the door, that was a relationship builder. Or man, you have the rigor. I've not seen that kind of rigor in this classroom in a long time. You had different groups of students doing different things. Way to go for differentiation. That is powerful stuff. Right? If you're a teacher and you get that kind of feedback, you're like, that is a powerful thing. What's not so powerful is having an evaluator come in with a checklist and listening to a lesson and expecting every single thing on that rubric to be evidenced in that lesson. And if not, then you get an evaluation saying why it wasn't effective, perhaps because you left out a certain element or a certain line or not all the check boxes. So I don't really uphold to that very much. That never worked for me. I'll tell you what, as a teacher, I had some really great lessons where I moved students forward, the learning targets were met, the standard 
line and I did not have all the check boxes of the team. Just didn't happen, okay? And then I had some other times that I may have checked off all the team boxes and it may not have been the lesson quality of the one I delivered where all the boxes weren't checked. So from a teacher's point of view and from an evaluator's point of view, I'm telling you, I love Tiger. I do. I think it is a great process. I'm going to even back up. I'm going to say I love the team rubric. You know, Charlotte Danielson built the premise of almost all teacher evaluation rubrics that are out there. It's based on those four domains. That makes sense. I mean, right? It's all about what we do. It captures everything. It captures best practice. You follow that team rubric, sister, you've got something going on in the classroom. That is great instruction. And it represents holistically great instruction day in, day out. Here's the two favorite words that I love to use, consistently and pervasively. If you are showing the evidence of the team rubric in the course of the year, you are a great teacher. I don't think anybody would argue with that. And so that rubric is a terrific rubric. And the Tiger process is looking at that rubric through a filter mechanism, if you will. It's just approaching it differently. All right, so I'm going to go on to this next slide. And this is all about the Tiger perspective. And maybe you can make the PowerPoint available to them. I know you have a handout packet, and I'll reference some of the things in the handout packet as well. And so what we have here is that part of the model in Tiger is that it's all about improving instruction and it's having that strong professional agreement that this represents great teaching, authentic evidence that you are not going in for a dog and pony show. So the Tiger process is very opposite. Of, I'm going to make my way into your classroom twice a year. I'm going to watch what you do twice a year. I'm going to document that. And in the end, that's who you are as a teacher. That's the score you get. You get what you get. Don't pitch a fit. Nope. So Tiger is very much the opposite of that. It's that authentic, ongoing feedback. It's who you are all the time. And so if you think about it, instead of having the two 30 minutes, you just gather evidence all the time. You're an evidence collector. And it frees you up to be in the classrooms. And you have to prioritize that. I'll just tell you up front, for this to work well, you've got to be out and about and in classrooms. You've got to devote time to being out there and capturing evidence all the time. And so in the course of the years, as you capture, that authentic evidence is going to piece of that. The other piece is reflective. A lot of Tiger involves work on the teacher's part. They need to think about who they are, what they do, and why they practice like they practice. Very reflective, a lot of self-assessments, a lot of self-analysis. The other thing I like about it, it's differentiated in that you don't treat all teachers the same. And I'm going to talk about stage one, I'm going to talk about stage two, and talk about stage three. And the cool thing, too, is that districts that do Tiger, you have a lot of flexibility. So even the things that I'm sharing with you today and the way we, quote, do, Miraville in, uh, do Tiger in Miraville, it can look different here in your district. And that's a great thing, too, in having differentiation on both ways. And Tiger's considered a growth model. So it's about not who you are to start with, but who are you at the end of the school year? And you say to yourself, now wait a second, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If I've been teaching 17 years, am I really going to grow that much in the course of a year? Well, I kind of like to think yes. I hope that you always keep growing and learning. If you cap out and tap out, go home. Really, just goodbye, you know? And, and every time I changed, every time I got the point of thinking, oh, I'm not as challenged, or this is feeling a little stale, I would ask for a transfer and go to another grade level, or I'd find something else to do. And so I think, yeah, you should always be growing as an educator. But the truth is, those seasoned veteran teachers, they're not gonna grow like those first, second, and third years. And hopefully they're not going to grow like those that are in a little bit of trouble and need to do a lot of work to show improvement. Uh, but they're going to grow. And so it's still rewarding that person for where you're going, not necessarily where you started, and certainly not two random snapshots of observations to decide 
where that person is. And so that's why those words consistently and pervasively come in there. Oh, hang on a second. So these are the six tenets of Tiger, and I'm going to touch on all of these as I walk through the presentation today, and hopefully maybe we should come back to this slide at the end, and you all can do a little check and balance and look at those six and say, okay, did she do it? Did we cover that content? You're feeling pretty good about that. And hopefully as I walk and talk through it, that you'll get authentic evidence, you'll see teacher growth, protected coaching, state partnership, differentiated process, and collaborative reflection. So our agenda, we're going to talk quickly about background and design and user uh, perspectives. A lot of that's in your handout. The comparison between team and tiger, that's in your handout. Lots of words, something you can go back and look at later. I'm going to spend most of my time just talking about the procedures of stage one, stage two, and stage three, and then take care of some Q&A with you as well. So the tiger way, we've already touched on those things. All that's part of the six different tenets. The history, I'm not going to bore you with that, but I'm going to let you know that uh, we have a TIGER consortium and they work together in order to build out the TIGER model. Every year we take a look at that and we revise that model and make sure we've got the tools that we need for that. We'll update handbooks and we'll get all the resources and tools out there. And that will all be for you to check a, take a look at later. These are the districts that use TIGER and we have a great little network where we, have, uh, we share ways to have productive evaluations and tips on gathering data all year long. And then that's our original board and our founders. And this is a perspective page. So I'm going to buzz through this perspective page and I'm going to get on in to what we need to talk about with stage one, stage two, and stage three. Here's our comparisons with team. That's also in your handout packet. And we've got three slides worth of comparisons with team. As I talk about the stages, in the end, you're going to get the comparisons and we'll come back to those comparisons. All right, so I'd like to paint a picture for you. Let me go back here, just take a look at this one right here. All right, let's get that one up as we talk. I want to paint a picture of what it looks like for a stage two teacher to go through the TIGER process. You'll have more stage two than any other teachers in your building. Stage one teachers are those teachers that are brand new hires. They're usually within their first three years of teaching experience. Can be a transfer from another school district that you're not quite sure about. Maybe they have some questionable student effect scores that got you a little bit worried. And it could be a teacher that's really struggling. They're not showing the gains or the growth that you expect, and they're the ones you need to spend the most time with. By design, stage one, you're going to spend more time with stage one, offer more support, and their pathway will be different than stage two and stage three. Your stage two teachers are those seasoned, veteran, experienced teachers where the majority of them are in your school are stage two teachers. I'm going to walk through that in just a few minutes. Your stage three teachers are differentiated. And that is the option that districts have to include stage three teachers or not to have a stage three option. The way that it works in our district, the stage three teachers work together in professional learning groups. We have three to four teachers in every school that's in that stage three category. These teachers are your high flyers. They're the teachers whose students are doing exceptionally well in achievement as well as growth. They have a tried and true reputation of yielding those kinds of results. They understand content knowledge. They've got pedagogy and instructional strategies down pat. They're the ones they could work on autopilot. Typically, if you go evaluate them and you get ready to leave and ask for a reflection, their reflection is as strong and oftentimes stronger than the feedback that you're giving them and the reflection. So they know how to fix before you say the first word. In the Tiger model, we do put them on autopilot. We give them a lot of freedom to do their own thing, and we only kind of come in as administrators once every three years for that formal evaluation and let them have peer evaluations and conversations, always knowing at the end of the day we put our stamp of approval up on that stage three evaluation 
position in order to fulfill the law that every teacher is evaluated every year, and it's that administrator's responsibility to do that. So here's how stage two works. I'll walk through that, then I'll revisit in just a little while stage one and stage three. Take a look in your packet, page three, I think. And I want you to pull up the Tiger Teacher Stages. This is something you might want to reference as we talk through this. This is one of my favorite and easiest documents to take a look at. All right. If I, to begin the school year, the stage two teachers in the building take the team rubric and they go through a self-assessment process. In that process, they actually identify the evidence to fulfill every element of the rubric. And they complete a rubric holistically and comprehensively just as an evaluator would. They take care of all four domains every element and that includes the professionalism part of the rubric. We often talk about how the rubric and all elements are not created equal. We believe that instruction is the most important and environment and then planning of course informs instruction. Professionalism is the last one there. So our stage two teachers will self-evaluate. They will capture evidence in the rubric that fulfills the rubric and then that begins the entire process. Administrators take the self-assessment and we have been using Randa Tower and I'm going to just say up front with Randa Tower, they, um, I guess you can just say they divorced us. I don't know how I felt like I was divorced and so out of the blue they notified us that they were going to drop ran to tower and no longer provide services. We did not see that coming. In fact, Rodney was the first person to inform me of that and that made me very mad. Really, like really very mad. And so we were working uh, to look for a solution and we feel pretty confident that we will have that. We're going to see what 10 Compass will offer and I already have three or four vendors that we're going to talk to to see if we can get another platform. So that's just a sidebar. If I mention Randa Tower, you will only know it's out of habit because that was the particular tool that we've used. The self-assessment is looked at and then the evaluator would go back in past years if we've had that and would look at the summative from past years to look to see what the goals are, the areas of strength and the areas to strengthen. And then that begins the journey for the year. Always keeping in mind what that looks like and what that is. Uh, our administrators do a lot of time talking together about the rubric and what evidence is strong evidence and what does make a score of five, what makes a score of four, what makes a score of three. We think it's really, really important that we would have inter-rater reliability. Some people call that being contiguous. I love that word, by the way. So if you're contiguous and we're scoring and we're looking to be inter-rater reliable, then if we were in the same observation together and I gave it a score of three, and you give the score of four, that's considered contiguous. That's two scores side by side. And that means we have a pretty decent inner rate of reliability. Now that's only true if you're off just a couple of items. If you go down that rubric top to bottom and you're off one every time, then that kind of adds up and you don't look as good. And so you look to have that alignment that's contiguous, but then again, you look to have an automatic match on a lot of the elements so that you won't be off at the end of the day on the entire rubric. And as you begin those observations, if all administrators in that school in particular, even better if we can go out to the district, if you've had training together and you've looked at lessons together and you've evaluated and looked at video lessons and, and personal human lessons and you become more and more inter-rater reliable, boy, that confidence level of your teaching staff really goes sky high because you know what people are seeing is similar across the board and what you're getting rewarded for is similar across the board. So the evaluators will have two observations. We can do four 15 minutes. We can do two 30 minutes. Most of the time in Maryville we say do at least two lesson lengths. Often that'll be longer than two 30 minutes. In addition to that, one of the strategies that we love is that we open a rubric on every teacher and that's called an open rubric. So you have your plans to go do your two observations and one open rubric that's there on your desktop or your laptop or even on your phone. The open rubric is used to collect ongoing data. 
And I had walkthroughs that I would do, and I had formal observations that I would do, and I'd have what were flybys. And that's when you get up real early and you start trucking through and you try to get into many rooms as you can, and then you get on back down to do something else. Wherever it would be, it could be an M team meeting. It could be a faculty meeting where a teacher's leading a PLC. It could be a grade level team meeting. Any opportunity, I'm gathering evidence, and I will put that evidence into that open rubric. So at the end of the day, when I have to give a summative score to a teacher, I've got two observations of data, I have their self-assessment data, and I have my open rubric data. So at the end of the day, the administrator looks at all of those levels of data and you make a final decision on who that person is and what you've seen consistently and pervasively. And once I get the summative scores that I think represent that teacher, I would email those scores to the teacher and this is what I would say. These are your summative scores based on the data that I've captured all year long. If you feel like that I've missed something, then please provide the artifacts and evidence or schedule a conversation. In that process, they were, the teachers were always allowed to upload artifacts and upload evidence. It can be through OneNote notebook, it can happen through Randa Tower, it can happen with your shared drives and your G drives in your, in your technology department. Uh, that can just go all over the place. So, when I'm evaluating a teacher, I take the entire rubric with me. It's here, and it's in Randa Tower. And sometimes, a long time ago, it used to be on a laminated chart, and I'd use a vis -a -vis, right? You know this, that's how we did it. And so, my thoughts are, I'd love to see everything in the instruction domain. That'd be pretty great. I'm not gonna see everything in the planning domain. I'm not gonna see anything in the professional. I hope I see everything in the climate and culture. That'd be pretty great too. And then I begin to capture evidence. When I send that to the teacher right after the observation, they're gonna see where I did not capture evidence on certain things. There'll be holes. I don't put, that I was, I don't put a score to it because I didn't see it. Uh, and sometimes I would even write on there NA. If I felt like there was no need to show it, then I would put NA. If I felt like they should have shown it but they didn't, I'd put, oops, missed opportunity, All right? So you don't score it because you didn't see it, but that should have probably been there. Everything that was there, we put a score to it. Another option in Tiger, you don't have to put a score to it. A lot of our Tiger districts don't. They just carry a lot of just evidence, a lot of descriptors of showing the quality of what they saw, but not a score. I'll be honest with you, Maribel people, we like scores. That is, that is just something they like. And let me tell you why. So at the end of the day, when it comes to the summative, if I'm only giving um, narrative feedback, my intentions of the narrative feedback might be it was a level of a two and a three, but the reader could read my narrative feedback and they're thinking, ooh, that's a four or a five. When it comes time to get the summative and I put twos and threes, and they were thinking what you said, what I thought you said was a four or five, you can see the disconnect. Y'all are shaking your head, you understand that. And we don't want surprises and we don't want to disconnect. And when we put a score to that, I'm not saying that's who you are. I'm not saying this is your summative. What I'm communicating is this. This is the score you get on this element at this moment in time of this lesson, period. That's what it means. And so in the end, when they get that back, they know what you didn't score, and then they know the level that was scored based on what you saw in that moment of time. They have the option before I even get myself back to my office to shoot me some artifacts and evidence of what I did not see. Often what I did not see at Foothills uh, would be student um, where they're collecting their own data and tracking their own progress, because you don't just get that out and wave in the middle of the lesson and say, looky here, although some have now. Uh, but you know, you can train them to do that. It's really cool if they do, I love that. And so uh, often they would shoot me then that the student has kept up with their AR points and here's a sample of that. The other thing that often happens when you practice that over and over and over again is that when you do come in for lessons, many times they will walk over and say, Here's this. I'd like you to take a look at this before you leave. How much better to do that right there in the yes. room 
than to have to come back the next time and do that. I appreciate that. And I would say to them, look, you know, if I'm missing something, the next time I come in, I'm going to be looking for that because I want to see that as well. And so it's that open communication. It's very transparent. And those artifacts can wait on you at the table, at the reading center. They can hand you a packet or they can take a photo with their phone and zip it to you that way through a text message. I'll take it any way that they want to send it to me. All right? So that's how that observation looks. That's how I'm capturing data. And then as I go to the summative, um, it's hard. You know, one of the hardest things that when I'm in those classrooms is being fair, giving them credit for everything that they're doing, and giving them some good constructive feedback of how to improve. Do you know the hardest ones to do that with? Those high flyer fives. Oh gosh, yeah. So that's what's so great about stage three, but even when I'm doing that, I'm always looking, what can I say to move instruction? Uh, what questions can I ask to get them to draw their own conclusions? And so a lot of my feedback looks like a bulleted list, and then I'll ask some questions. And that's a big thing with Charlotte Danielson, if you want to read that book, is asking the right questions for them to get their own mystery solved, instead of for you coming in like a little mopper and fixer. Because that's not what we want to do. That's just enabling and too much hand-holding going on. The other practice that I always follow is I say something to them before I leave. I just think, you know what, I am not going in there and clipboarding away or iPadding away or whatever, and I always will make a comment to any teacher before I leave, even if that person's a stranger to me, and I point out something that was highly effective in their lesson, and I look them in the face and I say that before they leave, because I want to validate who they are, and you can say some some tough stuff if you will just validate it that moment in time. And then if it flops and just, and it, I mean, if it just is terrible and everybody knows it, I speak that too. It's awful having an elephant in the room. And I'll say, I know you're disappointed. Uh, what, just tell me real quick, what would, you, what would you love to have changed about what just happened? And that is such a relief, you know, just to say it and then it's not hanging there and it's real. It's real and it's transparent. And then I'll be back and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have another day to fix this and we can look at this again. The other thing is, are they announced or unannounced? Well, you have some flexibility of that in your district as well. Uh, our philosophy at Foothills is they wanted to keep it real. I mean, it was as real as it could get uh, and, and very transparent and always rubric talk. We talked rubric all the time. I mean, I would just wear out the rubric in casual conversation and, and in parent meetings and early mornings and after school. And so our thoughts were the teachers said, we don't want you to tell us you're coming. Just come on. You know, and, and we, nobody asked for an announced observation, and we all chose as a staff. And I said, if you change your mind, let me know. Otherwise, we'll do two unannounced. Now, it wouldn't be unusual that that'd be in the middle of something, and sometimes I'd get a text or a call and said, oh, hurry. I'm getting ready to show something you've not found yet, and I want you to see this. You know, and so that kind of thing would often happen, and that would just be a quick drive through to get that done. All right. So are you with me so far? That is really how stage two looks, all right? And at the end of the day, I would say to them, if I've missed evidence, let me know. I'll take a look at it. Now, that's where some critical conversations come into place. Because here's what happens with stage two. So the stage twos that are almost stage ones, okay? Sometimes they really have a hard time reflecting and seeing themselves as others see them. Okay, that's also something that goes on with stage one. That's, that's usually the biggest disconnect. They don't see themselves as evaluators and others see them. And that's true for the lower end of stage one is they lack that reflective piece. So it comes time for summatives and I share it. And then they would come to me and they'd say, well, here's this artifact. And the one isolated piece of evidence that doesn't represent anything they've done. What's the two words I love? Consistently and pervasively all year long. And I reject it. I just do. And I'll say, you know what? I see this evidence and you are right. That is spot on target for problem solving and thinking outside the box. You're doing some of those skills. However, 
I have never been through and walked through where I see that type of thinking and problem solving activities going on. You're going to have to really get yourself away from the workbook, you're going to have to get away from this little tool, and you're going to have to build in more STEM activities, you're going to have to have more hands, and I justify why. There's other times that they would provide the evidence, and I was waffling between a three or a four, and they provide that evidence and have that conversation, and I have bumped the score up based on conversations with teachers. And I'm, I'm, I'm very consistent that I do <laughs> rejects and acceptance, and so they never know going into the process, it, I don't have the reputation of them thinking, well, if you'll just go talk to her, she'll raise that score. No, I don't. Because, uh, you know, it's based on evidence, but occasionally I do, so it kind of brings them on back and, and it makes it work. Uh, let's talk before, any questions about stage two and how that looks before we drop down and talk about stage one? Okay, let's talk about stage one, then how am I doing? I gotta hurry, here we go. So on stage one, I've already defined the teachers that need this. The best things that we've done for our stage one teacher, and even our teachers that, um, uh, they are maybe, um, they're just needing some really intensive uh, help. Uh, they're, they're about ready to maybe lose their job and, and they're on alert and they've been with the coach. Uh, the best thing we've done for those teachers, we send them to the Tiger team training. Crazy to say. And it goes back because they haven't unpacked the rubric enough to understand, know, and internalize the rubric. It's like a student who can't perform. They haven't owned it yet. And so we send those teachers to team training and make them go through and watch videos and then they have to become inter-rater reliable with the rest of us. It has been the best aha moments with our stage one teachers and the greatest professional development that we can offer them. You can do that in-house. Have someone that knows the team rubric like the back of their hands deliver that. You can use your own lesson plans. You can videotape that or you can send them to the state team training for that accomplishment to happen. We know that if they're able to unpack the rubric, and they're able to score other teachers demonstrating that and they become reliable with me as an administrator and now the two of us are contiguous when we watch someone else. That is hurdle number one. You know what hurdle two is? Doing it for yourself. You know, it's like the students in our classroom, they can rip up their little friend's writing assignment that when they write theirs and deliver it, it's like, oh, this is perfect. And it's not. It's harder to do yourself than others. So that next hurdle is, now you've got to evaluate yourself. We do a lot of videotaping of that person. Make them go back and look at that videotape of themselves. Oh my goodness, that's humbling anyway. Uh, and then they score it, the administrator scores it, and you look to see where that reliability is. We really push that more than anything, is that you would become reliable and contiguous with your administrator. In your stage one, it is protected coaching. So the stage one teachers will begin the year with a formal observation. Tiger does not require a self-assessment for stage one teachers, but we do. Because we feel like that group needs to be reflective as well. And so that's optional, it's not part of the Tiger process. Uh, the evaluator goes in and does a full comprehensive assessment of a lesson, lesson length, and gives feedback on that lesson. From that point on, a coach is assigned to that stage one teacher. The coach spends hours with that stage one teacher on giving them feedback of how to improve their instruction. It's often accompanied with mentoring if it's a new teacher within the first three years of teaching. If it's someone that's just a struggler, then it obviously it's just on the academic piece. They'll observe together other teachers. They'll try to become inter-rater reliable, and they'll work on small pieces and parts. Often these evaluations are not full rubric. They will only focus on the instruction. It's kind of like primary trait scoring where you just focus on one thing to get it better. You would just focus on instruction. However, if it's a teacher that more than anything, they, they're nailing the instruction, but the culture and climate's killing them. They're a one and two on culture and climate. They're a four and five on instruction. Well, come on then. Let's take care of the problem. Don't, don't keep messing over here in this garden. Just spend time, and every time you go in, you're gonna wear out the culture and climate. Now, let me say to this, 
Planning is a piece of that. You think it's not, don't, don't deceive yourself. You have to plan for culture and climate if you don't naturally have that inclination to have a positive rapport in culture and climate. So I would go right back to planning. I would say, show me evidence of how you've planned your culture and climate today. If they're planning reading and they're delivering that, then stay out of that. And that's a great thing that the coach can do. Everything that goes on with the coach and the teacher is over here. It's like it's just kind of scooped up and pushed over here. And there's not conversations that go on. They're not going to come and tattletale. They're not going to say this one's fault. So the only agreement we have with our coaches is if you feel like you need support and this is falling apart and you can't recover, you come ask for help. And, and we'll step in and get help. Based on the Tiger model, you go back for that end of that second lesson length observation and you score that lesson and then it's based upon growth. So when you're given that score, how much weight do you think goes on that first one the first month of school? No, oh, come on. No, very little. If it looks the same, a whole lot. <laughs> if it's grown, then you're going to put most of your weight here. Now, I keep an open rubric on that stage one person as well because I'm not about to give someone an end of the year summative score based on here and here. So they have an open rubric like everybody else. Uh, I, the big difference for me is that protective coaching that's going on, knowing that I've got help with somebody growing that person and that I'm truly looking for the delivery of a, of a good lesson. I want that stage one to focus on delivering a nice, good lesson. Quite honestly, it looks a little bit more like a dog and pony show. It looks a little bit more like at the check the box than our stage two because they're still trying to grow that craft. Does that kind of make sense? And what I'm checking in between would just add in there to that open rubric. You have any questions about stage one? Good? All right, stage three, let's talk about that. We talked about these are your high flyers. Uh, they're the ones that can do the job. All you gotta do is just stand out of the way. And we expect these to be our teacher leaders as well. And so they're doing other things in our building on leadership. Uh, always expect the student performance data to be really high here and the delivery of content instruction. Uh, I've, I've kind of summarized this already. Uh, they do their self-assessments together and more like a PLC conversation, uh, very analytical on unpacking that rubric. Uh, they'll talk about what does a four really look like and how's that different than that next score of a five or down to a three. Uh, and so they'll get that self-assessment. They'll share that among their teams. And often I won't even look at it. I won't, I'll just say, okay, that's a time saver for me uh, because I know that you're killing it and I'm not going to waste my time looking at that rubric. Uh, and then they'll start evaluating each other. They fulfill the same thing, the same obligation for 15 minutes or two thirties or two lesson lengths. And they give each other feedback. They also practice being inter-rater reliable and they practice being contiguous. Uh, and at the end of the day, they sit back down together. And most of the time, it's not your peers giving you a score. It's two or three peers sitting there together. Well, I saw this, well, I saw this, well, I think I'm this. And, so that conversation goes on, and then at the end, they submit the scores all the way through, top to bottom, including professionalism, uh, with all the evidence. Uh, and then I'll have the choice to put my stamp of approval on it or to have a, a critical conversation. And you know, I look for that because if you start to see scores just elevate, if I look down there and I see a five on everything, I'm like, whoa, Nelly, you know, uh, what's, what's going on that I need to get out there and take a look at that. Uh, and so if I feel good about it, I give, I, I put my stamp of approval and that's what goes in. If not, then there's some conversations that go on. I'm in their room all the time too. So I'm still doing the flybys with them. The only thing I'm not doing with them, I'm not taking my device in there and doing a formal observation and sending it to them. Once every three years, they fall back into what well, really, they're still stage three, but they fall back into the stage two protocol. So once every three years, they would fall into what I described as that stage two process and then be two years of peer and then one year back and then two years of peer and one year back. As I'm capturing the evidence for those stage threes all the time, if I get alarmed, 
and I think, uh-oh, this is, this is out of kilter and this is not going well. At any time, I have the option that I would bring them back into the fold where I'm conducting those evaluations and or even have conversations about a stage change and certainly about the option to be a peer evaluated. All of our stage three teachers do not choose to participate in peer evaluations with each other. Some of them just like to be visited every year by the administrator and they, they want that. And I'll tell you what comes up, depending on personality, there's not always comfort in evaluating a colleague. Not everybody feels good about that. I think sometimes it's those that they have the craft and they have the pedagogy, but they don't want to be the judge on someone else's uh, curriculum and somebody else's content. And sometimes it's tension in relationships. They don't want to be there, and it's okay. And we always give them the option to opt in or to opt out, okay? So, and let me just say one more thing about stage two. I want you to know that as at the end with the summatives, as those teachers are sharing, you know, I really feel like I'm a four here and you gave me a three and I'd say I couldn't because I didn't see it consistently and pervasively. I keep notes at the end at the Tiger process of um, what I want to see the next year or what I should see the next year. And I would say to them, look, I'm gonna write this in my notes. And next year, I'm gonna look specifically for this uh, because I wanna give you the benefit of the doubt and I want you to know that I'll be looking for that and I'll be gathering that evidence and I'm really hoping you're gonna grow there. And so as you do your self-assessment, you think about your goals for the next year. And that's all part of the summative conference that they have to look at the final scores and then they're gonna write the goals of what they want to accomplish against the team rubric for that next year, uh, how I reach or the digital conversion piece can support and be a part of that, what they think their strengths are, and then anything that they want me to focus on that next year. And you know, they'll put some really <laughs> neat things. I, I, one of the, my favorites was this teacher that had a tendency on proximity to want to teach to like this quadrant of the room. And so part of the feedback from me at the end of the year is make sure that I am moving around the room and, and giving the attention to all of my students. And we're talking about at that level of really honing the craft of teaching uh, for those excellent teachers that they're looking that nitty gritty about it. All right, how are we doing? So let's talk about the pros and the cons. We've talked about stage one, stage two, stage three, what it looks like and what it feels like for the teacher, what it looks like and what it feels like for the administrators. Teachers would say to us that it is a rewarding model. They like the fact that they don't feel like it's all based upon two moments in time that I would happen to pick from my glorious schedule to show up in their room. You have bad days. For crying out loud, there's been times as an administrator and a teacher that I was not my best and I sure would have hated for someone to have judged a year of my performance based on a really bad lesson. I will also say I learned the most from those rotten lessons to become a better teacher. I just wouldn't appreciate it for evaluation. So they like the growth model. I like the growth model too just because it's more organic and it's more real and it's who they are and it's capturing data all the time. And yes, it's, it's, perhaps it is more paperwork and I would just argue it's not more paperwork, it's different. You know, it's, it's a different type of paperwork. I had to train myself to be a better observer. I had to train myself to internalize that rubric to the point that I've got it memorized. I had to start with laminated sheets of paper that I'd take with me just to keep that fresh in my head. And so it's a different way to do my job. I would argue a better way to do my job. Differentiated, not a one size fits all. You honor the teachers that have the skill set and you help those that need the most amount of your time. We feel like it's very authentic. You know, it's about capturing that uh, content and that data over time. Reflection and self analysis. And then, I, look, I should have taken that off, Rodney, that ran to provide the technology platform. I, somebody, we hope, will provide that technology platform. We honestly are thinking we're gonna build it ourselves. I've got a, a guy that I'm working with on that. So if we do, we'll share that with you. How's that? And then uh, not, not supported by T and Compass. T and Compass, and I've not spent enough time because the news is still so raw, uh, they will have a lot of functionality added. So we're gonna look to see what that looks like and, and what we might be able to use for that. And then we feel like that there's this increased leadership time. Do I have any questions, anything you all wanna ask me? 
Hmm, I did it. Yes. Hey, just clarity on the stage. You, you mentioned the stage one teachers, and you mentioned starting with observations and maybe just focusing on the instructional rubric. And I assume that you're just going to do more walkthroughs and stuff to fill the rest of the rubric out as it goes. Yeah, let me clarify on that. So in that lesson, it's the entire rubric, okay. except for the professionalism. For the coaching, the protective coaching, gotcha. we encourage them just to focus on certain aspects of the rubric. So they may only do domain or this domain or that domain, but in the first and the last entire comprehensive rubric checking. Now that's what makes it more look like that check the box on those two. When I'm going in and I'm gathering it all the time, then it's just pieces and parts. And it's always the pieces and parts to match their rough spots. Because that's where they need the most feedback on. Yes? So when you were talking about the open rubrics, um, and I, this might be more a software question than anything, but is it possible for multiple observers to contribute to the same open rubric? Yes, and that's the great part. So my assistant principal would do that with me. And I built those, I'll send them to you. And the way that we did it, we just have our, our, our four domains, and then you have the elements, and I just built an open text box under every single element. We kind of call it a condensed rubric. And so we would come in and we would just put the evidence underneath each element. And we could highlight in different colors. I was pink, he was blue, get it, uh-huh. So, <laughs> so we would highlight what score we thought they were landing in and then our data would match that and I'll use a different font and then Rob would have a font so we had Amy font Rob font pink and blue yeah it worked and I'll be happy to send those to you I have some other things that I can send I even condensed rubrics and you know if you want to take those out with you and laminate them I still kind of do that as well and on the observation uh, so we, I, we have a variety. Some of our administrators do uh, scripting. I don't. I used to, I, I actually I keep a scripting pad next to me that sometimes I'll, I'll do a little bit on the side. But uh, in Randa and in my new platform, I, I just really had the rubric so internalized that I would just click on the different elements and I would just pack full my documentation into that. And, and a practice that I always like to follow is that I'd stay in the classroom even after the lesson and just get all of that data in there. Then I'd run back to my office and I'd often do the professionalism and give some feedback to that uh, and then even maybe planning and add to that later. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I usually like to perk on it for about 24 hours before I give feedback to teachers. Sometimes it's 48, but rarely. I usually would do about the next day. And, and here's what I always go through, and I, and I think this is important. I learned this, I think, from Charlotte Danielson, is that you want to give a teacher um, two things that could really pack a punch on improvement. And, and that doesn't mean that I didn't find a lot of things in the rubric as shortcomings. But in the, in the conversation, uh, two things is a plenty. You can give a lot of validation, but get your two worst things and, and just hit that with a lot of examples uh, and a lot of um, advice and a lot of resources. Match them up with someone in the building that has that skill set or a book or a, a video clip uh, to help out with that. Any, I thought I saw another hand. Yeah, sorry. At the middle school level, does Tiger provide any kind of differentiation between the academic classroom and the related arts classroom? Okay, so that's that's a great. It's a team rubric, and so for some of our um, the librarian rubric is there, and the school services personnel rubric, but we like PD we use and that. Art and chorus. No, and and what we do, and even on that, and then I'll be honest with you, uh, CDC classrooms and some of our special ed, uh, we just look through the filter of who that is and how that class operates on getting that evidence collected. Uh, there are some tools that are available on the team website that gives advice uh, with our pre-Ks and some of our early learning modules, and I think some of the special ed, but that is a filter we look through for those different groups. Yes. In terms of this being a one-year pilot, you've talked a lot about the stages. How would those stages like work with a pilot? As far as the, the uh, stage, like for example, stage three, we may not have uh, you know make great use of stage three in the in the pilot year. Uh, it we the, there the process is in place uh, where we could use the, the, uh, the data and implement based on on this year's and previous year's data but uh, that is that will be left to the design team to decide if we want to just focus on 
uh, stage one and stage two, uh, pull that stage three in. What what does it what does it take uh, to to be in it in the first year? So there would be there, there would still be not not that you couldn't be recognized for that level, of performance, <coughs> but as far as doing some of what she talked about um, with the peer evaluator evaluations, that part will be left to the design team. Wouldn't stage one just be a new teacher? That, uh, and Amy, you can talk about how you got how it's decided, but uh, yes, we will. We will do. We will have to set that. What the stage one criteria is as well for mm -hmm. for not. I know for yeah. you guys it's three point oh. Yeah, we set our criteria for stage one, stage two, and stage three. Every district has that flexibility. We did not do stage three our first year of implementing Tiger, and it was like I couldn't wait for the second year to start doing that. So everybody was a stage two or a stage one. The first year that we did it, our stage one teachers would be the brand new to the building teachers. We gave everybody the benefit of the doubt, gave them a stage two status. Then the next year, some were three and some dropped from two to one. Uh, and that's based on our cut scores of the overall teacher effectiveness. I will also say stage three peer evaluators must pass and attend the team training every year. Uh, so they have those same expectations that administrators have. If they let that lapse, they will not be, they do not have the option to be in that flexibility group. That, that goes away. I'll leave a copy of our flexibility and our Tiger processes and you all can take a look at that. The other great thing about having the stage three eventually in your building, you have other people that's been trained on the rubric. And so you know how that yeah, yeah, yeah wants to to go around like, well, they gave me a three, and I know it wasn't a three. You've got other people in the building to say, well, that really is a three. And, and the reason it's a three is because, and so it just richens the whole building. The more knowledge that everybody gets on the rubric, the better it is. And a lot of our staff development, and this is a great opportunity. I mean, I know you all have used team for a long time, but with the new process, it's a good time to unpack together with staff and for them to look at videos and for them to self-evaluate each other and themselves it's just it's good teaching and I'm thinking what an opportunity because you want everybody to be at that level the more that you can get to understand and own the rubric that's your job is easier just like that and what were you going to say about did I answer your question you did. did okay <laughs> any other question this is the question yeah. I guess I don't know who it's for as far as lead teachers are concerned so those folks are trained experienced teachers still they get a compensation yeah that we will still make good use of those again that will be a piece that uh, we will lean very heavily on you all to decide you know how we continue with that <laughs> with the walkthroughs and how how that fits together but we will let the the, the schools themselves uh, form that design team and be able to uh, to make those calls and I'll just speak to the tension there. Okay, so the difference between a stage two and a stage three by the time you're tallying scores can be one point. We've had teachers that make it by one point <laughs> and teachers that haven't made it by one point. And so sometimes in that category, you get a lot of comparison going on. I was at the grocery store one night and I heard two of them talking in the all over and I was like, oh Lord, don't let that be a foothills teacher. You know, I hope it's Sam Houston when I get over there. Uh, and, and their conversation was, well, I know she is not a three. And you know, it was, it was that kind of conversation. And so that happens, a little bit of professional competition uh, is part of, of having stage three teachers in the building and that those that are borderline between the two and the three so don't be naive about that when you implement that there's tension there but there's tension there anytime you have leader teachers do anything right if they're leading PD there's tension there if you ask them to do the staff event there's tension there I mean that's just the way it that's the way it rolls I'm not afraid of tension if you have uh, I'm thinking through the open rubric yes concept, which is a really neat concept to me uh, if, if you have a teacher submit some evidence that maybe you didn't collect, do you resubmit that into the, I do. the one that you did? I do. In my open rubric. In my open, I'm Just sorry. Open. In my open rubric, yeah. Did you finish that one, one of the two there? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, and you know, and even part of the culture, it's, it's so funny because we will be in the middle of <laughs> we'd be in the middle of an MT meeting, and part of the culture was, you know, the teacher would say something, and she'd look over me, and she'd go, she'd wink, and she'd say, "That was a five on that," you know, that kind of thing. So I think 
because of the open rubric and it's things that is we're talking about all the time you can have a lot of fun with that too uh, and and they do it's mindful all the time of what they're doing uh, and how they're delivering information and student. it's my favorite thing the open rubric is my favorite thing and you know again I'll be out and I'm like you know I have this thing that I flip jewelry you know to, so when I get back to the office I'll remember to do something and I wear a fair amount and so I'm like I flip the ring and, and then flip this and then I'll get back in there and I'm like oh son of a gun I can't remember what this meant or what this meant and then often I'll have my phone so I'll put a note in my phone but the best is if I just have my iPad with me and it, at the beginning of the Tiger Team process, the iPad made everybody nervous. They would love when I'd do flybys and walkthroughs, and I thought I have got to desensitize with the iPad. So I'd come in and just hold it up, like there it is, you know. Uh, but it makes it so much easier because then your open rubric is right there, and you can step outside. And so my practice at the end of when I was at Foothills, I would take the iPad, I'd lay it on the table, I'd go about myself, I'd pick up the iPad on the way out the door. I'm not kidding you, this is silly. I'd go out in the hall. Way, and then I go to the next room. I laid the iPad down. There's something about the thinking iPad that it just, you know, at the first little bit that it would just raise that anxiety because you were collecting data all the time. And then eventually it got just where they didn't care. Yeah. Hey, Andy, sorry, one more question. Yes. There's a good chance that some of these folks will be on this design team and drive these right. leads at work. But uh, can you just speak a little bit to Maribel's decision to score versus? not score, score some, score the like, what was the, just that mm -hmm. thought process? I can, and, and, I'll, and again, that was a little tension in our Tiger cohort. So, you know, we have some purists, uh, well, I guess you call purists on both sides. There's a group in Tiger and they just think no one should score. You never score a walkthrough. You give a lot of narrative feedback. You give a lot of verbal feedback. You give a lot of evidence, but you never put a score to it. I think their desire and in their reasoning of not putting a score to it, it gives you more freedom at the end to give a score. And it won't cause arguments within the process. And I'm like, well, our argument is it's going to be a big knockdown drag out at the end. <laughs> and I'd rather just see it coming. You know, that was kind of our philosophy is no, it feels kind of like you've had the rug jerked out from under you if you wait until the end of the school year and get the scores. And it was our Miraville teachers that said, we want to be scored. We understand it's not the score, but we want to know how you think we did at this moment in time on that. So across the board, all seven schools score and all teachers expect it, and it has not been an issue for us whatsoever. Some of the Dot Tiger districts that don't score, they've had conversations about scoring, and it's made everybody real nervous and real anxious, and there's been some fluttering going on. Um, and I'll say this too. Um, scoring for us makes us more efficient, so we feel like that bullets would be enough with a score, but if you don't put a score, then you're writing an epistle. Does that make sense? And I've seen some of the Tiger feedback. It's rich feedback without a score, but it is some long feedback and a lot of sentence types evidence. And we're doing phrases and, and, and you know, just kind of some one-liners. And it's a lot, but it's not, it doesn't compare because we think that paired with a score is a, is a, a really decent snapshot because after all, You've got a rubric, go back to it. You know, look at the three and see what that looks like. Look at the five and there it is, and here's the one. And so all of that kind of matches up together. Did, is that answer? Yeah. And we've scored from the very beginning. We've, we've never gone to a non-scoring. I know there were some visits to some other districts that didn't, and I know that yep. would be a decision point for this team. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, here you're right, and that was good. Yeah, and yep. this might be one of those areas where, based according to how many schools we get, that we may have a couple of schools not scoring and some schools uh, scoring to get that uh, to have that experience. So, uh, you know, there's a, that that would be one example of the pilot where you might have both models occur. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what else. Somebody asked over here about oh, who asked it about the uh, using the same rubric and principles all. Uh, so my assistant principal and I at the end we would look at all that together and we would sit there and say and I say oh gosh if I look at these scores then the score looks like it should almost be a f maybe a three but. I'm leaning toward a four. What's your thoughts? Nope, three. <laughs> you know, so then we'd have that, 
And then I'd sometimes even put a split score down. And I put the split score down for my own purposes, so if the educator comes back with evidence, that's a no-brainer, right? Because even Rob and I had trouble with that one. Usually I'd give the benefit of the doubt. We usually go on the high side, not the low side, uh, with the split score uh, right. and give them that benefit. One other question. So you talk about, which is a cool part, where there's a score, but then there's a chance for them to bring more evidence to it. So I'm thinking in the stage two, two observations if there was the score out. So the first score could come out, you have these scores, additional evidence is provided, then is that, does the, does the evaluator change the scores in yeah. real time or that's just to inform the next observation? Yeah, I would never do that. I would never change what I captured while I was in there. So they know when I finalize that observation, it is not changed. When they provide evidence, then I put a note on there, evidence provided, and I go back to that open rubric, and I'll put in the open rubric, evidence suggests levels of five. Maybe I saw a two, maybe I saw a three, but I put evidence suggests levels of five. So in the end, and I'm going across and eyeballing everything, that's my reminder to myself. And again, that's why we score it. I don't have that kind of memory at the end. I mean, it would be 43 teachers that I'm evaluating. And for me to remember everything that I've written just in narrative form and to think what level that meant. So the scores would help me and then my little notes. And at the summative, it's not hard. I mean, it really, it's, I've given them so much feedback with the, along the way. And I even asked you to text them sometimes with my bus through and walkthroughs. My summatives, I don't go back over that again. I'm not going to vomit back up what I've already told them. That's crazy. I don't have the time for that. And they don't need to hear it the second time. That's like a bad rerun. And so at the end, when I give them the summatives, I talk about their strengths and their areas to strengthen. But I don't rehash everything that I've given them along the way. We make that rich in process, and the summatives are knock it out and give it to them. Rodney, I don't know if this is a question for you or John, but some of us share teachers with other schools, and those schools may not be in the pilot process. So that might be something we need to just consider in terms of, you know, it's I don't mind doing their observations, but we just need to let those people let me, in those other schools. Let me just schools say that. Going, and when we had the, with the uh, uh, TAP and the team model, they, if they were in a school, 50%, if they were 50 50 between two schools, uh, the, the educator was allowed uh, to choose it, where the base school is or what base school, then that would be the model uh, that they were in. We could use that uh, uh, same procedure, but that would be certainly something that uh, leadership team and others can okay. uh, discuss. Just, but there, are, there are options. We already have a little bit of practice or experience right. with that, so we have some, some uh, solid ground to stand on. Okay. Yes. What is the feedback for the drive-bys and the quick, like what does that look like? Paint the picture of what that looks like. Oh, okay. So if, I, I, and I keep post-it notes in my pocket and I always have my phone in my other pocket. And so with our drive-bys, um, I love face-to-face -face because I don't have to have an ink pen or paper or anything. So if I'm just flying through and I see something on the way out the door, I'll say, Sister, you got it today. And I would specifically anchor that comment to something in the rubric that worked really well. Uh, or, you know, sometimes on my drive through I'd say, let me just take a look at your student portfolios in writing because I saw some incredible writing today. And then I'd just go over in the corner and I'd get those portfolios and spend a few times on that. If I'm doing that, then often I'd write a letter to the students and I'd write a, a little note to the teacher with post-it notes and just put on the front of those portfolios. So it's very different based upon what I've seen. The easiest and fastest is just to have that verbal conversation. And the best case is to know the areas that that they're struggling with and to look for that and then to give immediate feedback back to them on that. Um, you know, and so a lot of times if we're working on like, uh, one thing we're working on a lot in Miraville right now is blended learning that technology tools are used wisely, not just for the sake of technology. So a lot of our comments are framed around that and that in the elementary schools, uh, too much hand-holding. So we're looking for that productive struggle and so uh, a lot of conversation. And so that's the other thing. As you push these initiatives, you just let the initiatives go right with the rubric. And you look for all the elements of the rubric of, OK, how can my initiative pair with the rubric? And then if you can double that kind of feedback, 
I mean, that is really the great way. But it's not uncommon for me to text them, just to step out in the hallway and to shoot them a text right then and there. And it's a sentence or two sentences. If I saw something really concerning, then I'm, I would probably come back and, and during a planning period and have a conversation about that. And I, or often I'd say, explain to me why you did that today. That was really interesting. Or how did you think that went? Were you disappointed in, in the students' responses to that? Yeah. Beginning of the year conferences, what's that look like in the buildings? Or do those happen? Or do Okay, on the pre-conference, so pre-conferences only occur with stage one teachers in our Tiger model, and so we don't have pre-conferences with stage two and stage three, so that cuts back a lot of that. We do the summatives at the end of the school year, and that's where we look at their goals and the areas of strength and the areas to strengthen. I would only have a beginning of the year conversation if the teacher requested it, or they're a stage one teacher, or I've got some other issues, or student performance data comes back over the summer, and it doesn't align with what I saw on the tiger. Uh, so, you know, for any of those disconnects would be the only point of a pre-conference. And even a lot of people would say, do you have, after every formal observation, do you have a conference? Yes, I usually do. It, the length of that depends upon that teacher uh, and, and where they are. Yes? Just for clarity on the materials that you handed out, um, it, it says specifically for stage one that the observations are done by a principal and then the other ones it doesn't mention that so how do mm -hmm. you use your level three do they help we call them lead teachers do they help out observing stage two teachers in our school system they do not the level ones are done by the principal and the assistant principal so are the level twos or the stage twos and the stage three that's that's where that lead teacher comes on now they will be mentors for stage one teacher. So they'll do those informal, non-scorable observations for improvement, but not for uh, teacher effect. Now, how's the back? Um, do you guys utilize lead teachers, though, like lead teacher evaluators? We, well, that would be our stage three. Uh, we do not, and even, we do not even compensate our stage three teachers any differently. We only do strategic compensation if they are doing additional duties. We have a lot of stage three teachers that are doing peer observations uh, that are not compensated, and a lot that are doing it, but they're compensated because they're an eye reach coach on the side or they're um, a literacy coach. We have no full-time coaches. When I say coach, all of our teachers teach a full regular day and they just do that in their planning period after school and before school and then we do give them some professional lead. So we don't have lead teachers the way you all have them. So our lead teachers then could evaluate Yes, I would think that could be a design model that you all could take advantage of, knowing that in the end the principal has to put that final score on there and they're responsible for that, that overall observation data. Yeah.